You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir... I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark. This is the call-in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, please feel free to do so. The phone number here is 608-501-0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line, and we do have a new caller. So, new caller, tell me what's been going on, man. All right, Ryan, this is long overdue. Yeah. Adam from Eau Claire. All right, let's do long this. Long-time listener, first-time caller. I've been saving this one because <laughs> I think it's good, and I've just been waiting for the best one. All right. So, Brian Gutenkunz. Yes. I've been defending him for a very long time, and I'm getting a little sick of it. I just finished up one of the Packernet After Darks, and it got me going. Okay. I could do the research myself, but I kind of want you to load the chamber <laughs> so I can use it for all my endeavors. All right. You there? I need okay. some information against Brandon Bean. I believe that 2018 was the same. <laughs> Ryan, don't you dare play this. I suck at this. This is why I don't call in. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. There's a rule here. I got to play it. I got to play it. You're good, dude. It's fine. Who cares? You're on it. Brandon Bean, let's do this. All right. Take two. All right. This is Adam from Eau Claire. <laughs> Don't you dare. I got a request from you, Ryan. Yeah. You got SIS. You got PFF. All you right. You got all that. Yep. I know you don't do your research for uh, Packernet After Dark. Correct. But this might be a good show with everything slowing down here for the main show. Great point. I really think Brian Bean, or Brandon Bean, yep. whatever his name is, and Brian Gutenkus are the same person. I think that they have done very similar things, and there are two very different outcomes on how they are viewed in the national media. Brandon Bean... I mean, without even looking at it, how could you really argue necessarily that that's not true? I mean, just just based on the, the teams being very similar. They're both very good teams with very good quarterbacks that are clearly Super Bowl contenders, I'm talking about over the course of history. Um that have built great teams that have had great success and, you know, you know, obviously some holes here and there, but they've done a good job of patching that through free agency in the draft and building these powerhouses that do a great job but just haven't quite gotten the deal done. Um, obviously, there's much more nuance to it, and I'm sure a lot of the anti gutekunst people would say, well, Gutekunst inherited this fantastic football team. Which, I mean, a- a- at the very least, you do have to give them credit for acquiring the assets that made it as good as it is, whereas the Packers, a lot of the assets are Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, guys that were already on the roster. But at least as a starting point, without even doing any um, big deep dives into it, you had two failing teams that the GMs came into and turned them into powerhouses that had very similar results. But anyways, continue. Probably, if you ask anybody, top five GM. Maybe higher, oh, depending on who you ask. And Gutekunst. I don't know about today, but I know if you go back a year or two, it was un- undisputed he's the top GM. Like it's not even close, especially with um, uh, Bill Belichick now kind of falling. He's he's it, it, it's kind of crazy because he's kind of going through what the Packers 
went through where the Patriots were just untouchable and their owner and their GM and, and everything else, like absolutely untouchable. But then all of a sudden, Ted Thompson like became kind of a joke and Mike McCarthy became kind of a joke. Bill Belichick is becoming a joke on both fronts, right? You, suddenly your team sucks and your draft picks suck and literally have people laughing at your draft picks live on television, um, other head coaches. Um, but you, with that all happening, I, I would say undoubtedly he's considered top five. I would say he's probably considered number one on most people's lists. Let's say just have this terrible, terrible... Uh view with everybody so i think if you go through all the draft picks free agent signings go through all that and do a deep deep dive yeah i think that you will find that either Goog is better or at least the same and definitely not uh bad enough or much difference to be 30 less in rankings which most people probably do so if you can put together a whole episode or half an episode or 10, 15 minutes, I know you really went through it on one of your Packernet After Darks, but if we can get a full on so we can go for all the points and go through and compare the two, I think they're going to be very similar. If you can do it, you can do it. If you can't, you can't. That's more for the main show and not the side show. I understand that. Yep. Keep on keeping on, Brock. No, I, th- I think that's a, a great let, – let me just read it to you. Okay, because I I think when you hear and this is the thing, people love to post Brian Gutekunst's drafts, especially like two years of it, not the whole thing, but like two years of it to be like, look how garbage this is. Let me just read every single pick that this man has made. And you can tell me what percentage of them are high end players. Remember, try to think about this the same way you view Gutekunst, where every single pick that isn't a good player gets scrutinized like, oh, that fourth round pick. What a joke. All right. Ready? Tredavious White, Zay Jones, Deion Dawkins, Matt Milano, Nathan Peterman, Tanner Viejo. Now, by the way, there are a lot of G. I I was going to say some GMs. I would say most GMs um, with with few exceptions, and the Packers probably are one of the few exceptions, are kind of built on the backs of like one really dominant draft. That's a pretty solid draft. Now, I don't think anybody necessarily maybe Deion Dawkins I, again when I do the deep divey thing maybe is is like an elite player Tredavious was elite for like a year and then he got credit for being elite for like three years because he was so good that one year but really he had kind of been dropping off significantly and now nobody talks I forgot Tredavious White was a person to be completely honest I haven't heard his name in so long but you know again it, it goes into the notion that he's a great drafter right Tredavious White Zay Jones not very good but slightly competent I guess Dawkins I think is pretty good but I can't remember Matt Milano is a big name but I don't think he ever was elite uh Nathan Peterman I mean he's a fifth round quarterback what do you expect and Tanner Viejo was a name that sounds familiar 2018 Josh Allen and this is like 95 percent of why he's considered a great GM he got Josh Allen congrats on that after that Tremaine Edmonds who the Bears just signed, which should tell you something. Um, Harrison Phillips, who's solid, no question. Teron Johnson, Saran Neal, Wyatt Teller is very good, I think. Maybe not. Ray Ray McLeod and Austin Prohl. I don't. I remember the names. I, I, I don't think they're doing anything. Okay. So that was 2018. Now we get into 2019. Ed Oliver, massively underperforming based on his talent level. Uh, or what he was expected to be. Cody Ford, I think is pretty good, but I don't know. Devin Singletary, running back, solid. Dawson Knox, eh. Uh, Voshan Joseph, Jaquan Johnson, Daryl Johnson, Tommy Sweeney. Okay. 2020 now, getting a little closer. AJ Epinesa. I don't... I don't think he's really... Cracked into that elite territory. Zach Moss, Gabe Davis, Jake Fromm, Tyler Bass, Isaiah Hodgins, Dane Jackson. By the way, they've drafted quarterbacks two out of the last three years, which is kind of, or three out of the last four years, right? Um, Okay, so that probably wasn't a super great draft, right? Maybe Zach Moss is decent. I don't don't know. I, I think they have good running backs. I can't remember if it's Singletary or Moss or both. I don't know. Uh, 2021, Gregory Rousseau. I think he had a pretty good year. Not positive. Boogie Basham, Spencer Brown, 
Tommy Doyle, Marquez Stevenson, DeMar Hamlin. Obviously, we know him, not for being a great football player necessarily, but for his incident. Um, Rashad Wild Goose, Badger, I think. Jack Anderson. I, I don't think any of them have done anything. Have they? Has anybody on that, I mean, aside from Gregory Rousseau, done anything? I don't think so. Um, and then, 2022 first-round pick, Kair Elam. Elam. Elam? I thought it was Elam. I don't know. Has he done anything? I don't think so. Uh, James Cook, another running back. They love taking these running backs. Uh, Terrell Bernard. Khalil Shakir. Matt Areza, the guy that... I, is he still the punter, or did they end up cutting him? I think they might have cut him. Christian Benford. Luke Tenuta. Balon Specter. I don't know. Here, I'll tell you what. Here's what we can do. Probably could have done this to begin with, but because you uh, are a first-time caller and because uh, I played your call that I wasn't supposed to, I will do a little bit extra for you. Not full-on research, but there's an, another easy way to do this. So on offense, Deion Dawkins, 73. Ike Bodiger, 60. Josh Allen, obviously, is very good. Trent Sherfield. 61 grade. Naheem Hines, 63 grade. I'm just going through. This is 2018. Kyle Allen, 27 grade. Ryan Bates, 61. Dawson Knox, 66. Uh, Keyshawn Johnson didn't play. David Edwards, 58. Connor McGovern, 53. Damian Harris, running back, 75 grade. Uh, Deontay Hardy, 47 grade. Gabe Davis, 66. Reggie Gallman, 60. Isaiah Coulter didn't play. Desmond Patman, um, 55 grade, Spencer Brown, 53 grade, Tommy Doyle, 51 grade, Zach Davidson didn't play, Quentin Morris, 45 grade, Ryan Van DeMark, no grade, James Cook, running back, 73 grade, Khalil Shakir, 65 grade, Alec Anderson didn't play. So those are all the players, and I think some of them are guys that they may have brought on, but if I didn't list them, then there's a lot of guys in here that just didn't, you know, haven't played, got cut, got traded, whatever. But this is the year that these guys were brought in. Of that group, we've got good players in Deion Dawkins, uh, Damian Harris, who was drafted by the Patriots. You got James Cook, who was a second-round pick this past year, who had a 73 grade. And then there's Josh Allen, who had a 91.8 grade. So as far as the offense is concerned, there's, um, what, three players? Dawkins, James Cook, and Josh Allen that are good or great that he drafted. The entire offense is really, really lacking, to be honest. They have Stephon Diggs and absolutely nothing else, which, you know, I thought was a crime against humanity. But apparently when it's any, any team other than the Packers, it's completely fine. Uh, again, running backs, they have James Cook and Damian Harris. So they have two solid running backs, one of whom they drafted, one of whom they got from the Patriots. Uh, tight ends, they don't have any good tight ends. They don't have a good center. They don't have a good guard. And they have one good tackle in Deion Dawkins, who was a second-round pick in 2017. All right. Defense. Uh, let's see how he did on defense, going all the way back to 2017. Again, some of these he may not have drafted. Tredavious White, again, who was elite at one point, 58.9 grade. He ranked 81st out of 118. So he's fallen off. Everybody forgot. Uh, Matt Milano, 77 grade. So he's actually still playing at a pretty high level. That was a 2017 pick. Um, I think same year as Tredavious White. Um, uh, Eli Ankau or something, 58 grade, Tim Settle, 57, Saran Neal, 59, Teron Johnson, just going straight through the years, Teron Johnson, 67, Kendall Vickers, 47, Ed Oliver, a 67 grade, first round pick, what was that number, where did he go? Number nine overall, 67 grade, Tyrell Dodson, 48, Cameron Lewis, 50, Cortez Broughton, didn't play, uh, Taylor Rapp, 76th grade, but he came... Who drafted Taylor Rapp? It was the Rams, and, and he's not... I can't even give him credit because he hasn't played yet. He's currently on the team, but he hasn't played for the Bills at all, so Taylor Rapp doesn't count. A.J. Epinesa had a 57 grade. Uh, that was their top pick in 2020. He was 94th is where he ranked. Dane Jackson, 58 grade. Uh, Jared Maiden didn't play. Gregory Rousseau. Did uh, get an 80.9 grade, so that was a good draft pick. First round pick. Boogie Basham, 69. Damar Hamlin, 61. Zane Anderson, uh, safety. He only played one snap. 
Kair Alam, 64. That was a first-round pick. Uh, Terrell Bernard, 64. Balen Spector, 27. Christian Benford, 55. Kyler McMichael didn't play. Kingsley Jonathan, 50 overall grade. Jamarcus Ingram, 60. So that's that. Um, they have a, a decent amount of solid players, but uh, the, the highest graded is Von Miller, who he didn't draft. He brought over. So we'll see if he can perform at a high level. Gregory Rousseau, again, good pick. Matt Milano, linebacker, good pick. Taylor Rapp, who they brought in for this year. We'll see how he does. Uh, Daquan Jones was drafted in 2014, so that was before his time. And that's it. Everybody else is 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, and 20s. And and you know you're and that's the thing. I can do this for every single team. This is this is the number one thing I ask people to do that that I've never had anybody do one time when they start trashing Brian Gutekunst. Tell me who the number one GM in football is. I'm not asking you to tell me who an average GM is. Tell me the absolute best GM in the entire NFL. Who is it? And then I get to go back and look over their record. Best I think anybody's going to be able to come up with is a guy that's been in the league for like one or two years and had like a, a one or two good drafts. You get a guy that's been doing this for four or five years, you think I can't pull out like a draft class and go, uh, yuck, what a disgrace. Are you freaking kidding me? Look at this last draft class. He hit on a, on a uh, running back. whoop de freaking do It's not hard to do. Running backs are always pretty good. It's easy. First round, second round running backs, they, they draft a bunch of second round running backs and they pan out. And the funny thing is, not even all of them. They've done it, what, three times and one of them has panned out? But Kair Alam, Terrell Bernard, Kirill Sh- none of these guys have done anything. They've got one mediocre running back in the second round in this last draft. The year before, Gregory Rousseau, good pass rusher. Everybody else, nothing. Not a single thing. Look at the 2020 class. What did they get out of 2020? Nothing. There's not a single good player in that draft class. What do they get out of the 2019 class? Oliver's no good. Cody Ford is gone. Devin Singletary's gone. I mean, I've never seen so many players not on the team anymore. Their second and third round picks from 2019 are gone. That's why I was reading off this list. I'm like, I don't recognize any of these names because they've gotten rid of their entire draft classes. None of these guys got contracts. Tremaine Edmonds, gone to the Bears. Right? Where's where's, uh, Zay Jones? He's gone. Where's Nathan Peterman? He's gone. Where's Tanner Viejo? He's gone. Where's Wyatt Teller? He's gone. Where's Ray Ray McLeod? He's gone. Austin Prohl? Gone. <laughs> Everybody's gone. Zach Moss, the running back they drafted in 2020. He was gone in 2022. He was gone last year. He didn't make it through his third year before getting sent off. They drafted Jake Fromm. Where is he? He's gone. It's crazy to me. But again... Similar results, not really crushing it in the drafting category, but he got Josh Allen, he paid a billion dollars for Von Miller, so he's a freak, I guess, I don't know. Oh, and and he went out and acquired uh, Stephon Diggs. He drafted the quarterback, and then he got him his wide receiver, so everything he does from this point on is great. And and, uh, by the way, I think that's kind of how the media narrative works. He got, he, he drafted the quarterback, which by the way, he was a freaking joke until Josh Allen turned it around, probably in part because third year plus Stephon Diggs, whatever. But he did two things, and he's set for life. Everything he does is great from this point forward. It's going to take years of running this team into the ground before anybody says anything. But the guy's got a great coach, a great scheme, a great quarterback, and enough pieces to win football games. And so the team wins, and the GM's a genius. But Brian Gutekunst crossed Aaron Rodgers. And Aaron Rodgers is, according to the media, again, this is this is their standing position, the entire team hinges on Rodgers. So if you come in and hack away at Rodgers, you're the biggest idiot on planet Earth. Nobody's going to look beyond that. Has, has Gutekunst had failures and mistakes? Of course. But again, here's, your, here's what you have to do. Find me the number one GM in all of football so that I get to go in and nitpick that GM the way you nitpick Gutekunst. And if I'm able to do that, then you're full of crap. I mean, tell, when was Brian Beans... Brandon Bean, I did it too. When was Brandon Bean's last just freaking knocked it out of the park draft? When was it? Was it his first draft? It might have been. Or the, the year they got Josh Allen and pretty much nothing else? Could have been that too. I don't know. And by the way, I'm not even going to sit here and say he's necessarily a bad GM. You, again, you got to quantify a baseline and, and, and look at these things, and he may come out near the top. The point is context. Most of the arguments against Brian Gutekunst are bunk. 
And the reason is you're, you're, you're comparing him to a standard that doesn't exist. Look at this one bad year. Look at these 17 bad draft, cla- uh, draft picks. That's not how you judge a GM. And in fact, Brandon Bean may have very well done his job because he got the quarterback, he got the right coach, assuming he got the coach, I don't know, but he, he put the pieces in place to make a team that wins. He deserves credit for that. So, somewhat unfair because a GM's job really seems to hinge on find that quarterback, support him enough, and then just keep this thing moving. It seems ridiculous, right? Because it, it should be based on you get the most hits and you get this, you get that. But the, t- the, the GMs that find the quarterback end up being the ones that win. So what did Brian Gutekunst do? He found the quarterback. Now, maybe he's not the guy, I don't know, but prioritizing that, knowing that if you hit on the quarterback, it's more valuable than hitting on, on five picks every single year. Everything, in, everything hinges on finding that next guy. That's why you see so many ridiculous swings. That's why you're going to see guys swinging at Anthony Richardson and all these projects, Will Levis and everybody else, because just maybe. Because if I can hit on that, then guess what? As a GM, I'm set for freaking life. I'm Brandon Bean. I'm going to get that guy. I'm going to sell the farm for the top wide receiver I can get. I'm going to, I'm going to do a big Devontae trade. I'm going to send a first and a second for that dude. I'm going to connect this quarterback and this wide receiver. I'm going to do some patchwork offensive line BS, and I'm just going to try to stitch together whatever I can. But as long as I got that, and as long as I can find a good coach to put in there to, to run the right scheme and everything, boy, we're off and running. I'm just saying. it's It seems simplistic and... Um, Maybe a little bit unfair, but at the end of the day, you can judge a GM based on what uh, percentage of, of hits they have, which isn't terrible. I mean, and that that I don't think that's how you should grade them overall, but it's, it's maybe a um, scouting and drafting score. But ultimately, your job is to build a winning football team. Brandon Bean's done that. So is Brian Gutekunst. So yeah, I appreciate the call, and I love doing that. I, I really do. I mean, I, I just, just for fun, I'm not going to do it now because we've got to get to other calls, but I, I just Googled one article, who is the best GM, and they still had Bill Belichick at the top. I would love to go back and look at Bill Belichick's draft record. And again, it's not all about drafting. It's free agency and everything else, but everybody picks on Brian Gutekunst because of the drafting. That's always the biggest thing everybody gets upset about. So that's what I like to compare to everybody else. Brandon Bean is maybe getting about one hit per draft, and that hit could range from 70 to 80 to 90. And the only 90 is the quarterback. In 2017, he got Matt Milano. In 2018, he got uh, Josh Allen. 2019, I don't think he got anybody. 2020, I don't think he got anybody. 2021, he got Gregory Rousseau. 2022, he got running back James Cook. That's his draft record right now. Hey, what's going on? It's Omar Sanfada. How what y'all up? doing out there? Uh, just call in like a quick second. Now uh, We're on spring break. Hope yeah. everybody have a good spring break, family vacations and stuff planned. Uh, we in Myrtle Beach right now. We actually about to leave. We've been here for about a week. Nice. Um, but I saw a couple of news. I just want to know if you hit on it already. I might not. I didn't finish to get all the caught up on the podcast, That's so you right. might have talked about it. But I saw a couple of things. One is uh, about resigning Levitt back, which I don't know if I'm really excited about that. Yeah. I think he's a good special team player, but I was hoping we could find like good special team players, but who can also play <laughs> on the like defense or the offense, and not just specifically special teams. Um, unless you like a kick return or a punt return or something like that. So I just wanted you to run through his grade and see if he did. A, was he good on special teams this year? I think he was, but I, I don't know how his safety grade was. I don't think he was very good at safety position. But let me know. Also, Rand- so I didn't really talk much about Dallin Levitt other than I think just mentioning that we re-signed Dallin Levitt. I don't mind it, just because you know we we did a lot of work of bringing in guys, and it got us to be, you know arguably the best special teams unit in football, depending on, you know, maybe when you started tracking it and uh, how you track that. I don't really know, but uh, very, very big, awesome turnaround. And I also think a lot of that is culture. And honestly, I think Dallin Levitt leads, I think he's sort of the the locker room leader on special teams. I remember Aaron Rodgers mentioning that, you know, generally there's like certain guys that talk and then there's everybody else that really doesn't. And he stepped up and said something. And, and it's not to say Rodgers was mad about it, but it was just kind of like, a, you know, it's not really his place, but he still kind of stepped up and, and took that leadership role and made a statement. And I think that's that's who he is. And so I think for that reason, even if he had like a 40 grade, I, I would want him back because a lot of what we need is culture. 
And if he's driving culture, even if it's just special teams, good. And then you're right. We should maybe bring in a little bit here, a little bit there. And even if that's just in the draft, that's fine. But when these guys show up, undrafted free agents, drafted guys, maybe a street free agent, they come into this locker room and they, they're going to learn from Dallin Lovett what it's all about. And it's not just what he says and how he lives and how he leads himself. He's, as, as sort of the coaches will say, he's sort of a psychopath. He gets on the field and he's just going to kill people. And he's going to kill himself doing it. But that's the thing. He, he's going to show you, like, this is what's expected. If you're playing Packers special teams, which I love, and that's the thing. Packers special teams has been a joke for a long time, but these new people don't know that. That's what I loved about getting those Georgia guys. They don't know anything but being great. You know, all these guys were, they were great when they were playing peewee football. They were great in middle school, elementary school. They were great in high school. They were the greatest. Then they, I mean, think about it. You have to be the great, one of the greatest in the entire country if you're going to a place like Georgia. Then you go to Georgia and you win the freaking national championship, largely on the back of having the most elite defense in all of college football. Right? You go to Green Bay and you don't want the culture to be, yeah, we kind of have this bad defense, you know, we're not super... No, forget that. You just want them to come in with that same mentality of we are the absolute best. And I'm glad that we have guys, we got Quay and we got Wyatt and we got these Georgia guys like Stokes. Jair already has that mentality. Um, I want to add that. And if, and if there's bleed over, you know, special teams getting hyped up saying, hey, you know, this is Green Bay special teams. We do things different here. These guys don't know that Green Bay's legacy of special teams has been trash. They're like, oh, dang, like this is next level. Like this is this is the elite of the elite. That's what I want the culture to be for everybody that walks in. Offense, defense, or special teams, right? Matt LaFleur is always talking about the standard, the standard, the standard. But that's that needs to be led from the locker room. You know, whatever you were doing back there, it's, it's not good enough. Here is next level. We are the elite. You know, we, we are the absolute top dogs. This is the Navy SEALs. This is the Rangers. This is, you know, recon, whatever. Raiders. So just for that reason, and, and I'll be honest, it's partly out of uh, laziness, but also partly out of just the fact that it, it doesn't really matter to me if you want my honest answer what his PFF grade is. Because I think that really is just a, a, a big culture thing. And of course, the news, I'm sure you probably talked about already, about... Uh... The 49ers coming in with the Aaron Rodgers thing, yeah. like maybe if the Jets trade fall through, I'm loving that because all that is is making his value go back up. Yep. And at the end of the day, the 49ers got a first-round pick next year, I believe. So we can easily trade them to the 49ers for their first-round pick next year because they probably won the Super Bowl anyway. Like, oh, they was almost at the Super Bowl without a quarterback. So you just put a combo quarterback on that team, they straight. Um, so I could definitely see that, you know, getting like a player and then like a third round pick this year and the first round pick next year or something. That will work out. I would hate that because we probably would have to go against them again. But you're talking about ratings, that would be awesome. Um, but anyway, just wanted you to run through those facts if you didn't. And uh, hope you have a blessed time. All right, go pack, go. Appreciate it, Omar. Um... Yeah, I mean, it, it all, and I, I don't necessarily think the Packers just keep jacking the price every time this happens. I, I think both sides are in a stalemate, and I think the Packers have stood their ground. I mean, we heard from Brian Gutekunst, like, the ball's in their court, and I think large, and it, it, honestly, if you ask the Jets, they'd probably say the ball's in the Packers' court, because essentially, I think they've both given the other team their bottom line, and they're like, look, this is what it is. Um And, you know, again, it doesn't sound like they're working real hard to just work out these couple little details right if that was the case you wouldn't say the ball's in their court they're saying we're close we're working on it we're, we're close to getting a deal done no saying the ball's in their court means i gave them the ultimatum i gave them the price and it's up to them to make a decision on what they're going to do um and and all this is though the, the 49ers thing and the stupid gm going on and saying yeah aaron Rodgers is going to be here all it is is who's going to blink first and if i'm brian gutekunst it's just more ammunition to not move you don't have to move, right? And it was, well, yes, they do because uh, I understand the Packers have their own situation, but you're wor you're 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 focused on your opponent, not yourself. If you're just focused on yourself, you're going to reach over across the aisle and make any deal possible, which is what everybody that refuses to acknowledge the Jets situation wants the Packers to do. Look, you're in a tough spot; just give them away. All right, stop being so stingy. Stop being uh uh uh. No, you're playing your opponent, dude. 
and your opponent is 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 in a position where they have to blink. You've pro- you've now promised Aaron Rodgers, and it's funny because Jets fans keep saying, "No, we didn't. No, we did. We never said he has to come here. We never promised anything. That doesn't mean anything." Well, now the GM actually came out and did promise Jets fans that he will be here, and then there was roaring applause. Right? Jets fans are feverish. Jets fans on Twitter will say that they're not. I don't care. It's not that uh, bull crap. Packers fans, are we even nearly as feverish about the compensation? Like, if we get two seconds instead of a first, you know? Like, that's going to just be the greatest thing. No, it's it's not even close. It's not close, right? Our situation doesn't change very much. Jordan loves our quarterback. Aaron Rodgers is not. We know we're going to get some level of compensation. Don't exactly know what it is. It might be something kind of awesome. It might not be. But it's not going to end in anything other than, like, dude, that's freaking awesome, or dang, that kind of sucks. Right? That's it. And then we move on with our lives. And we move on with a season that is identical to the season prior to, with the exception of maybe one additional, maybe, maybe two additional players from the draft class. Maybe. Which, I mean, we're going to get additional players from the draft class anyways. Just a matter of what round and how many. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's going to happen. Nothing, nothing changes for us. Well, what if the deal falls through and he's stuck? He's not going to be stuck. The Packers are not taking him back and Rodgers doesn't want to come back. We will hand him to somebody else. Here, give me a seventh. Great. Bye. And he's off our plate. He will be off our plate. The Packers will send him to somebody for some compensation. Well, he only wants to play for the Jets. Bull crap. His number one option was to retire. And when that fell through, his, his number two option was to play for somebody to shove it up the Packers, you know what. Jets are the option because the Jets came out and talked to him and he said, yeah, that sounds good. He didn't talk to the other 30 teams and say, no, I don't want to play for you. Aaron Rodgers will decide whether he wants to play for another team or retire. I mean, come on, man. He's not coming back. And so, no, Gutekunst is not going to flinch. He's not. And again, all this other stuff is just reasons for the 49ers to flinch. You have to do this. I don't have to do this. I have other options. You don't. Anyways, why don't we go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back, and we'll do more stuff, because that's fun stuff to do. Bye. See you in a minute. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not as simple as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened up so many more doors. The show is called The The Deal. Deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A -a one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people 
and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Hey, Ryan, it's Jimmy. Hey. Um, I had uh, a funny thought that just occurred to me as I was listening to your latest and going on and on and on. And I just thought, let's try to picture the time before you had this podcast and that like your wife, like, you know, a lot of husbands, they bring up a crazy idea uh, and the wives are like, eh, I don't know about that. I am guessing when you're like, hey, I think I'm going to start a podcast. It's like, well, tell me more about this. I'm like, well, I'm going to go to my basement and I'm going to redirect all of this Packer commentary into a microphone and sit in a room all by myself. And and then that's all. And uh, but she was like, "Hell yeah, go for it!" Because <laughs> I can only imagine the amount of um, Packer theories and commentary that she was inundated with prior to this podcast. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you saved a lot of her brain, but but you know, just proximity wise, uh, she's probably your biggest fan, uh, the biggest Packer Dad fan that is. Uh, anyway, that's all. Go Packo. Bye. Well, I will say um, one of the things that everybody that knows me, most people that know me say when they listen to the podcast is uh, something along the lines of, who is that? Um, I know everybody at my work said that they like this guy better. I'm not much of a talker or a sharer. And um, to be completely honest, it's the exact opposite as you described. My wife would love it if I just sat around and told her everything about the Green Bay Packers because she wants me to tell her every single thought that's inside of my head. Um, and I don't do that. Uh, my wife and kids don't know anything about the Packers. My, you may have heard the intro to the podcast recently where my daughter called the po- the podcast the Internet Podcast. She doesn't know the name of my podcast. So I don't talk about stuff pretty much ever. Um, so no, she was not inundated with anything. Um, in fact, when I have ideas, it's always like one of those things like, what are you doing? Like, I don't know, nothing, don't worry about it. And say, well, why are you downstairs all day? Like, I well, I'm just doing something real quick. And, you know, event, she has to, like, drag it out of me. And I don't want to talk about it because I have an idea and I like it and I want to do it. And I don't want to hear how it's a bad idea. And how are you going to, you know, you get to spend time with the family. And is gonna, how much money is this going to cost? And da, da, da. I don't like that. I don't want to deal with it. And so I just, I just try to ignore it. And I see if I can, like, sneak in, like, a little thing here. And, like, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just going to do my little thing. And don't worry about it. And... Um, then it becomes a big problem. Like, why are you not telling me things? And it's just, it's this whole thing. I don't know, man. I just, I don't like talking about stuff. I think it's because when I was a kid, every idea I had was stupid. You know what I mean? Like, did, let me, let's just be honest here. Did you grow up in a family where you were told basically in every facet of your life, just shut up and do what you're told. And then if you ever said you didn't like it, you were told, yeah, well, life's a bee and then you die. And so that was how the picture was painted. You wake up because it's time to wake up. And then you take a shower because it's time to take a shower. And then you get your backpack because it's time to get your backpack. And you bring it upstairs and you get your lunch. And then you eat cereal because that's what you do. And then you go out the door and you go to school because that's what you're told to do. Then you have to go to the classroom that you're told to go to. You're supposed to go to the seat that you're assigned to. You have to listen to the teacher tell you everything that the teacher tells you and write exactly what the teacher tells you to write. You go to recess when you're told. You eat when you're told. You're like a freaking robot every single second of your life. And any time I try to branch out and be like, hey, I was thinking about doing this. It's like, no, why don't you just, you know, I had to tell my dad, like, I wanted to start like an online business or something. He's like, no, that's not what you do, right? You, what you need to do is get a job at McDonald's. That's what you do. You don't become a business mogul at 16 years old. You go to McDonald's, you flip burgers. That's what you do. That's what I did when I was little. That's what you're going to do. End of story. And see, so, I, I have this... I'm sure everybody has it to some degree. Some people seem to not, which I don't understand. Like, oh, I love it. I have this life where I just wake up and I go to work and then I come home and then I wake up and then I go to work and then I come home and then I wake up and then I go to work and then I come home. It's so great. I love my job. I love everything about my life. It's like, you're freaking insane. I have this insatiable desire to be free to do whatever the heck I want. And I have ideas and I want to explore the ideas and I want to do this and I want to make money and I want to create and I want to build and I want to watch it grow. And like, I want to just be free to do stuff. I hate with the passion of a thousand sons living another second of my life in which I am bound to a schedule that somebody else sets for me. My entire life is dictated to things that I have to do because I have to do it. Just because I have been doing that my entire freaking life. 
wake up, take a shower, get dressed, go to school. Wake up, take a shower, get dressed, go to work. Go home, go do your honey-do list, go to sleep, wake up, do it all over again. And then you do this for basically the rest of your life, and then you die. There are billions of opportunities out there right now with the internet and everything else, and now AI is exploding, and there's all this kind of stuff, and there's wealth generation, and people are out there making things happen and creating things and getting wealth and living with freedom and all this stuff, but not you. You're a freaking robot. You sit there, you do what you're told every second of your life, and then you die. The, the disdain I have for that, I cannot explain. And again, I am for some reason, like very paranoid about telling anybody anything I want to do because I don't want to hear no. And all I've ever heard is no. Or some kind of like, I don't know about that. How much is that going to cost? I don't like this. And so anybody in my life that's kind of like that, I just don't want to tell them anything because all I'm going to hear is, that's not a good idea. Or what about that? When all I really want to hear is, dude, that sounds awesome. That's crazy. Great idea. We should do that. Freaking A. Because that's what my brain says. So, am I broken? Probably, but that's where we're at. So, no, um, people don't hear things because you tell them things and then they tell you you're stupid and then I get pissed off. Or you get excited and spend like three hours making a dinner and then you put it in front of everybody and your entire family complains about every freaking thing. You know what I mean? It's like, you know what? I'm going to cook dinner for myself and you guys can have cereal because the people that I want to eat with are people that are, eat the food and they're like, dude, it's so good. But no, what do I get? don't touch my food anymore my food get out of here me and the little one the baby that eats everything we eat you guys do whatever you want get out of my face final thought speaking of childhood trauma (laughs) do you know what would happen to me if i acted like my kids did toward me Do do you guys ever has anybody out there ever felt stuck in that where it's like the example my parents set makes me feel like a failure because i would never say to my parents, or my mom specifically, my stepmom, what these kids are saying to me. My life would be freaking hell. I'm not kidding you. I might have had a plate thrown at me or got smacked in my mouth or something if I said anything other than, I love it, thank you, all that stuff. At the same time, my stepmom was kind of a douchebag and a psychopath and abusive. And maybe I shouldn't follow her example. But also my kids are disrespectful. So I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't want to traumatize my kids and be like my parents were because they sucked at being parents. No offense. I mean, you know, they did their best. Best you can do when you're psychotic drunks. I don't know. Anybody else ever get stuck with that? I know some of you don't have kids or have young kids or whatever, but, you know, my age, you got kids or older or whatever. You ever deal with that? Like, you you feel like you should handle it like your parents, but then you realize your parents were not good parents and you don't want to be a bad parent, but you also feel like a bad parent because my bad parents, although they were bad, they also kind of instilled things like respect in me and... Try to toe that line? No? Okay. Well, I don't want to turn into Benjamin Albright here and start uh, airing every single... (laughs) What the heck is that guy doing? Jeez, he must have been hammered when he did that. you imagine waking up the next morning and just getting on your phone and being like, what did I do? I am never drinking again. Right, Aaron? (laughs) Hey, Ryan, this is Andy in Kansas. Hello. Curious about what you think as far as... The Packers. What was even that question? <laughs> Did I answer a question? I don't know. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andy. Are they rebuilding? Are they on the cusp, kind of between rebuilding and contending? Uh, I would say it's more that way, but I've heard you say, you know, at least kind of allude to them being maybe one or maybe the other. Yeah. Like, how do you even, how do you decide whether a team is you know, rebuilding or contending or reloading or something like that. Just in general, like, do you you think of it in terms of they're at 60% capacity, therefore they are still rebuilding, or once they get to 70, and what I mean by capacity is is, uh, players are, you know, knowledgeable about the scheme, working well within the scheme, finding success, being able to make plays, not just – follow the, you know, the, whatever the defensive or offensive call is, but actually making individual plays that are uh, incredible to some degree. Um, and then secondly, in terms of the draft. Let me let me pause there because I don't know how far away from that you're going to get. I haven't really thought about it before, but there, there, well, there's two things. The, the difference between the categories and then where do the Packers fall. I was thinking as you were talking, there, there, it seems like there should be like four categories, right? There's contending which is we're ready right now. 
there's reloading, which is um, we can contend assuming we can like patch these one or two holes. Like right now we're struggling, right? Like let's say with the Packers, um, we need a wide receiver. We need a tight end. We need something. Otherwise, I, I, I don't know that we can get there. But I'm, I'm confident we can if we can kind of patch these couple areas out. That, to me, is reloading. Um, and then I think there's there should be two more categories. Because, in my opinion, rebuilding, even though it, you know, kind of is, is the same thing. It, to me, it has the connotation of going backwards for the sake of, like, tearing down and then rebuilding. Um, or, or maybe, maybe, maybe the four categories would be rebuilding and tearing down. I don't know, but I was thinking of it in terms of rebuilding and building, but the, the, the next category would be like, we, we have a foundation right now and we're just building onto that. Like for example, the lions, we've kind of built out the trenches. We might have a quarterback. I'm not sure. We certainly got some weapons, the running backs, the wide receivers. We've got to build out this defense. We, but you know, if we, we're not necessarily, Although they would probably disagree, but I think it, looking from the outside, they're a building team that probably is not just one or two pieces away, but is is on the right track if they can continue to hit. You know, and, and again at a faster rate that the, than their purging talent, which is the the complication. And then there's sort of the tearing down, rebuilding thing, which is like what the Bears had, where the GM came in and um, you know first thing he did was draft best player available. You know, just getting whatever I can get. And then he just started cutting everybody, right? Khalil Mack's got to go. Roquan's got to go. Akeem Hicks has got to go. Uh, left tackle, whatever his name is, he's got to go. It's just cutting everybody. Like, the, these are not guys that are going to be here for the... Like, the, the first is the acknowledgement, we are not winning this year. There is... So contending is a big part of it. You know, we're contending right now. We're one piece away from contending. We're several pieces away from contending. And then we're not contending. So the teardown rebuild is we need to strip away everything with the assumption that this is not going to be our year. Maybe even next year is not going to be our year. If you're a lot of money and you're about win now, you got to go. So he starts hacking away at all that. And then you, what you got left over is probably a bunch of backups, a couple decent starters. And so now we, we try to get into that position of building. And I don't even think the Bears are necessarily there. Although if they do have their quarterback, which as of right now they don't, we'll see what he can do this year. Maybe he takes a big leap. I don't know. If you have your quarterback, you've got a big piece. I think they're confident in their coaching staff, their scheme, their structure. They have a direction. So maybe they're kind of in building mode now, right? They've hacked away all the pieces they don't want. So last year was the teardown year. Now they're in the building mode, and they're kind of at the bottom of that phase. We need an offensive line. We need probably some more wide receiver help because we kind of just have one right now. We need corners. We need line. Eh, well, they paid a bunch of linebackers. We need edge rushers, defensive tackles, um, and maybe maybe a running back or something. I don't know. We, we have one that we like, but, but we, we've got a ways to go. So... Um, yeah, I think I think they had their tear down. So then you've got your building, your reloading, and then your contending. I think would be sort of the four categories. As for where are the Packers? I think most people would say they're kind of in the building phase. We're, we're certainly not tearing down. We have, we have a lot of young talent at this point. I mean, Aaron Rodgers would be sort of, I guess, kind of a tear down. But it's not with the expectation that we're nowhere near. We're not even at the point of building out our base. We have our base, right? We have. Whether or not they're dominant pieces or, or could be upgraded is irrelevant to the fact that we we had like the third best offensive line last year. We have an offensive line. We have a quarterback. We have some wide receivers, although we certainly need more. We need some tight ends, uh, safeties. So so there's there's several pieces. But whether that the the question is, are we building or are we reloading? Kind of in terms of the terminology that I kind of made up. Are we there? We're, we're certainly not contending right now. I don't think. I'll say this, and um, I'm going to try not to say too much because it's it's one of those weird things where you kind of hear things through the grapevine. Um, there is sort of a source out there somewhere. Um, I can't necessarily speak to the validity of it, but it's been a reliable source. Um, I'll just say that perhaps we're underestimating the Packers' vision. And let me say this as evidence. It's interesting to me that GM Brian Gutekunst seems to want to really build around Jordan Love this year. He wants picks for this year. Why would that be the case if we're just kind of rebuilding, if we're in the low-end building phase? It's not as important. The only real reason you would do that is if you're concerned that you know he's going to break in that first year or whatever because things are so horrible. But let me pose another theory to you. They are really, really excited about Jordan Love. And if Jordan Love can be a good quarterback, why are we not contending? 
because we're we're right back to being the same Packers team. I mean, we don't have Devonte, but then we're still in that building phase. We have the quarterback, we have the offensive line, we have the defensive line, right? Defensive tackles and edge rushers. Maybe not the depth we want, but we have it. We have the corners, we have the linebackers. What are we one hundred thousand percent like? We cannot compete without this. Not much. I mean, I I think we probably need to do something at safety, but I'm not entirely sure. It's it's one of those things where you can you can put it out there with you know Savage and and you know whatever we have kind of piecemeal together out there Ford or whatever. But then if you look at it and say, what if we do get like a really good tight end or a really good wide receiver or both? This team isn't contending with a with a good quarterback. First of all, anybody with a good quarterback could be a contender. But then you add in, we have good wide receivers, we have great running backs, we have a really good offensive line, we have great pass rushers, we have solid corners, hopefully some good linebackers. I mean, this is, this is a good group. So I, I would pose to you, and maybe the Packers are wrong in this, but I think we are underestimating the Packers' view of, of how good this is going to be. And ultimately, that speaks very highly, if I'm correct, that speaks very highly of their opinion of Jordan Love. And ultimately, at the same time, even if Jordan, even if you weren't sure about Jordan Love, why wouldn't your goal be let's go all in? I, mean, I shouldn't say all in because that has negative connotations. But why should we not just continue to build and say let's just go for it? Let's freaking hit the gas here because we're clearly not a team that has nothing and needs to completely rebuild. I mean, what 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 are we really massively missing here? The most premium positions we have covered: quarterback, wide receiver, tackle, edge rusher, corner. I mean, we 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 might not have two. I don't, I don't, we don't have two tackles or anything, but we got at least the one. So it really just comes down to Jordan Love. And if you believe in him and if you're watching him and you actually think, dude, this guy could be the guy, then play, you know, slow playing this as though we might be a couple years out could be detrimental. I mean, it'll be great down the line if you're taking guys that are, you know, developmental, you know, he's, he, he's a couple years away, you know, Rashawn Gary types or, you know, you got to kind of coach him up. But once he gets there, he's going to be, no, get the guy that's ready today. What are some players that if they draft player X, it's a sign that maybe yeah. we're more rebuilding or, oh, they took that guy. Oh, okay, because of that guy's position or abilities or whatever. Maybe that's a sign that they really think that they can contend already uh, this year. So if there's specific players that you can maybe uh, plug into those scenarios, the rebuilding scenario or the contending scenario, um, please talk about those. That would yeah. be interesting to hear. Thanks. Bye. Well, I think one of the the signs might be an aggressive trade up. Um, you know, if the if the Packers are expending resources, you know, future resources or whatever, to you know go up and get say Jalen Carter or Will Anderson or even Jackson Smith and Jigba, right? Drafting Jackson Smith and Jigba doesn't necessarily mean they're going all in on this year or anything because we do need wide receivers. We're thin at the position and there's still question marks in terms of, you know, what the high end return is going to be for them. But if they trade up for him, you know, it 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 is somewhat in my opinion of a signal. Um also, you know, you've got things I don't want to necessarily say tackle because we do need a tackle, but it's kind of one of those things where we need it, but it's kind of a future need with, for David Bakhtiari. You know, I mean, if, if if the goal is he's going to come in and dominate at right tackle, like he's built to be a right tackle, he's a freaking road grader, he's going to be, you know, he's Brian Balaga. Awesome. I don't. I, again, it doesn't necessarily indicate anything because it's short term and long term, but um, I think a corner pick to me is not necessarily an aggressive like we're going to take it because where where exactly do they play? They probably take Stokes's job or something and and hopefully Stoke, you know, so we're we're not really gaining a lot of ground. Um other than that, I mean the the only real thing is, you know, again, you're kind of comparing value this year compared to the future. And and the Packers I don't think are ever going to do something that's detrimental to the future. You you need to be able to be somebody that we can depend on long term or whatever. But there is a difference between guys that are pro ready, like plug and play. Here's a hole. We filled it with a guy that's a stud today. And like, you know, this guy is, you know, a developmental project, but man, when when you know when Bakhtiari leaves, he's gonna be a star left tackle. Or, you know, Brian Branch is gonna play in the slot and then maybe we'll fig you know, I uh, 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 kind of maybe sorta like great player, we'll figure out where they go later. But I mean, most picks though are going to end up being 
short term and long term. The only thing would be again, sort of the developmental prospects would obviously lean toward not being super productive. Although we would have said Christian Watson fell into that category last year. You know, he's 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 got a lot of talent, but it's going to take some work, and he kind of blossomed pretty quick. So I think we'll just see how aggressive they are. And and trading back, by the way, can be an aggressive thing. It's not to say, well, if they trade back, then they don't care. Well, that just means we're getting more players. So, you know, if the value wasn't necessarily there, they didn't love those guys and they trade back and, you know, we get an additional second or uh, whatever, which, you know, I don't know how many seconds we'd be up to at that point if we get some from the Jets. But, you know, you trade back, then you get Michael Mayer in the 20s or something crazy. Then you got three second round picks or four second round picks. Packers could probably do some damage. So we'll be able to speculate, but I think at the end of the day, they are probably going to try to sort of stick to their board. But there is always, always those situations where, again, there's there's players kind of equal on the board, and you have to choose between these guys. And if that's the case, that's when you kind of maybe would look at it. But, I mean, there be maybe situations where the best player on their board is the only guy there, and they take him, and it's not an indication of what direction they're going. They're just following the board. So at the end of the day, we're never really going to know unless it just seems massively overt, you know, and and again, how aggressive are they in getting draft capital for this year? You know, if the Jets are like, look, we'll give you, you know, one second this year and a conditional first next year. Well, that's primarily the value next year. And just one second is all we get to help Jordan Love this year. And they're like, no, we don't want that. So maybe they would take like the two seconds this year or the 13 this year, you know, something like that. But if they're insistent on mostly, not necessarily the 13, but on, on 2023 value, not future value, that might end up being some kind of an indication. Because again, I want to win today and in the future. I mean, these guys don't just play for a year, but we don't want to neglect this year. We want it to be a good year. Hey, Ryan, it's Goose here. Call hey, in. Goose. I'm to see you today. Packing up after dark and I was listening to Steve up in Alaska oh, talk yeah. about shows. They brought up Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time and the atrocity that the uh, Amazon series was. And, oh, I gotta agree with them. That is, I'm so glad they canceled it because they just completely botched it. <laughs> but my point is, what is the deal with that? Why, why can't people take what is like the Wheel of Time or another book similar and do like they did with Lord of the Rings and be faithful to the source material and we see how that works out. They end up with Oscars and all kinds of accolades and people love those films to this day and they're just considered to be classics and untouchable and you don't mess with those. People see that success. They see the success that Game of Thrones had, but they botched the end of that too. <laughs> and they decide that they're going to do their own thing. Their writers are going to do better than the author who already has millions of fans. Why is that? Is, is, are these the same people who are like, Drew the Guns doesn't know what he's doing. He didn't draft T. Higgins. It's his fault. <laughs> We didn't get a Super Bowl. The same mentality. I just don't understand it. But, second point, because I don't want to have a complete effort. So I'm going to take a position that maybe I don't believe it, but I am going to argue. Just on, I'm not sure if we're getting completely off the topic, so let me just briefly touch on that. As somebody who does not read very much and if i do it's going to be nonfiction, not fiction um i don't really have a position on this i know people that um really like book series get super ticked off if people make movies or whatever and it's not accurate you know i've never had anybody who read and loved a book series say dude the movie was better i've never heard that before um, and I think it's because, I mean, you fall in love with something and not only that, but you're reading the books, so you kind of picture things and everything else. And it would just be annoying right off the bat. If you have a picture in your mind of what somebody looks like, and then you watch the movie and it's like, nah, it's stupid. What she looks like. She was way better looking than that. Trust me. But yeah. And then there's scenes that don't show up and they add things and whatever. I, I, I don't know, man. I, I would always just go to the movie just because it's so much easier. 
Like, how long is it going to take me to read a book from Lord of the Rings? It's going to take me forever. And I'm not going to... See, then that's the other thing. Like, I, my, my brain just does not... I, I can't handle it. I'm so bad. Even... I struggle with movies remembering who's who. I cannot remember. I don't remember names ever. Like, I, when people say they're bad with names, I don't know if other people struggle with this too. I can't follow along with movies because I'm so bad with names. There'll be that scene where they're like, Oscar said this, and I'm like, oh, which one was Oscar again? I know he's one of the main characters, but is it that one guy or the other guy? I don't know. And that's like a major part. Like, now they're going to go kill Oscar. I'm like, who are they going to kill? I don't even know who that is, because I can't remember whose name is who. I was just doing that with, uh, there was some, I think it was another Netflix series, but there was this, um, it's kind of interesting, but it's kind of at the end, I was like, I'm not sure if I'm glad that I sat and watched all that, or if I feel like I wasted my life doing that. But this, uh, I think he's a famous actor. He looks very familiar, but he goes to some town, looks like it's out in Maine or something, I don't know. Somewhere out east is what it appears to be. But fishing town, and anyways, he meets this girl and she ends up killing herself. And he's a retired detective, so he goes around and tries to get to the bottom of it. And it's pretty interesting stuff. But, I mean, they'd be talking and be like, Percy this. And I'm like, who the heck is Percy? Oh, that's the girl that killed, like I said, that's the main, okay, yeah, Percy. But I, I just, I can't do it. So then books are even worse because I don't even have, like, faces to go along with anything. So I'm, I'm like... 60 pages in and they're like Jonathan said to Percy about Dakota and I'm like dude I I don't know who's talking I don't know who he's talking to I don't know what he's talking about I can't do this I can't follow along you just have to have a strong imagination and you can like hold on to these things and like draw a picture in your mind of like Jonathan is this guy he's that character and you remember I can't I cannot do that I don't know if that's some kind of a disorder or what I just I have no ability to hold that stuff in my head my wife will show me pictures of people that have gone to our church for years, and I'll look at them and be like, I've never seen that person in my life. Like, yeah, we we went to their house one time. I'm like, no, I've never been there. I don't know who that is. So anyways, I can't really contribute much to that discussion, but I am very sorry for those things that have happened. I, w- I will say it, would be, it wouldn't be that hard, and I'm sure they would love it. Imagine if they got like 50 super fans. It would be super annoying because they're all nerded out, and it's they're going to be very annoying but at the very least you can just do you know like that rating system where there's like a dial and you'll watch it and they'll just go to zero when you do something stupid and just be like all right what's the problem and then they'll tell you and then you'll be like all right fine if you're gonna freak out about that i thought it was a good idea but apparently you guys hate it you know what i mean like just just get the feedback because that does happen all the time like with game of thrones or whatever i never read the book i didn't watch the series but people would just freak out i can't believe they did that like, didn't they talk to, could they just talk to somebody beforehand, before you do this stuff? Have have a super fan vet it. I don't know. Uh, huh? We're being a little bit overly dismissive of the changes that a good receiver would bring to the offense in 2020. It may have freed up Adams and Lazard a little bit more, opened up our offense a bit more, if we had another stud receiver. It may have changed that game. I won't say it has zero sense. But I'm also going to sit here and go, tell me who. Tell me who. Don't tell me a rookie because we all know how that goes. It is so rare for a rookie to come in and dominate. A rookie would have just been having another player equal to Lazard or to MBS. And they didn't do shit in that game either. Well, you're right. I mean, it, it's it's but that's... And I, I know you're not missing it, but I'm just saying, I, I still think that's missing the point. What would have happened if we had drafted a better edge rusher, brought in an edge rusher who had more talent, right? We only got two pressures and no sacks in that game or something, right? So bringing in a pass rusher, you don't think that would have helped? Of course it would have helped. How about bringing in a different corner for instead of Kevin King? Wouldn't that have helped? How about a different safety? How, how about a different quarterback? We might probably wouldn't have gotten to the playoffs, but you know, if we just plop a new quarterback in there, that's better than a sixty. Or no, that was twenty twenty. You said so, quarterback wouldn't have been better. One of those other years, quarterback. So you're right. I mean, all these things are correct. What, what if we had a better offensive tackle than freaking Billy Turner? My point is, first of all, no idea, no idea if that would have helped, if they would have been healthy, if they would have even been there, if they would have been on the field, or if they would have been on the bench. We also can't just assume, well, they had a good good year, therefore they would have been good. If that's the case, then we would have won that game because Devontae was good all year and he wasn't good in that game. And again, I can go through the whole list. You can't just assume that because somebody had a good season that they would have been great in that game. Lots of players have bad games, and for some reason there's a problem. But the biggest point is, just like the pass rusher thing, 
We don't need to go get a new pass rusher. We needed the pass rushers that were there to do a better job. Again, I think in that game, MVS, it was at the year that MVS had like 120 some odd yards or whatever. So we didn't need a number two. We had a number two in MVS that, that did his job, did a damn good job. Didn't seem to help Devontae. He still couldn't really do anything. Maybe that's why MVS had the day that he had, but it wasn't enough. So what? T. Higgins takes that job and he gets 150 yards and a touchdown? Cool. Now what? Now what? We still don't have an offensive line. We still don't have a pass rush. We still don't have corners. What do we do? So yeah, I, I'm not going to dismiss that a rookie may have possibly helped. We don't know which rookie. We don't know how much they would have helped, how much they would have played. And it doesn't change anything in regard to the point that we had all the talent we needed. But the talent didn't show up. And again, like, well, Devontae was double covered. That guy faces that every single week and he gets elite grades. He didn't in this game. We had a number two that blew up. It wasn't enough. We didn't have what we needed. We had the players. The players didn't show up. So, yes, you can run this fantasy where maybe that would have pushed us over the edge. Fine. Congratulations. Then what? Then you know we win the next game? You know we win the Super Bowl? Of course you don't. You don't know anything. We don't know that Aaron Rodgers would have showed up. What if he just played like garbage? You think he didn't have bad games in 2020? You think every game he graded out as a 90? What about Aaron Jones? What about Mercedes Lewis? Blah, 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 blah. So again, it's not so much that, no, it's impossible that there would have been any help. It's just that the, the, the focus is completely on the wrong thing. Here, let, let, let me do this one analogy. It's stupid, but it's one that came to mind. Imagine if me and my family started a cleaning service, me, my wife, and my kids. And you being a listener and you're nearby and you're like, oh, you're starting a little business. That's cute. I'll, I'll give you a little help, whatever. And all you really want us to do, like some simple task, like just clean my kitchen, clean the sink, do the dishes, sweep and mop the floor, clean the counters. And that's basically it, right? You don't, you don't need to worry about like scrubbing my fridge or anything like that. Like you can dust it on top, but you don't have to get in there and root around my food and all that. It's kind of weird anyways. So sweep and mop the floor, take care of the counters, do the dishes, clean the sink. You're done. We charge, say... 20 bucks an hour for the whole family. Deal of the century, right? You pay us $100 for five hours. Shouldn't take that long, but five hours. And in five hours, we walk out of there, and it's not done. In fact, almost none of it is done. We loaded one load of dishes in the dishwasher. We didn't start it, and there's still more dirty dishes in the sink. The counter is still kind of dirty. We, we swept it onto the floor, but we didn't really scrub it. We didn't clean it. There's like chunks of stuff still on there. The table's still dirty, and we swept the floor, but we didn't mop it. Five hours. Let me ask you. Are you going to be frustrated that the five of us didn't do the job? Or is your first thought going to be, you should have hired a sixth person? I should have paid $25 per hour, $125, to get a sixth person in here, and then the job could have got done. Bull crap. I paid a fair wage to give you way too much time to do a simple task. You didn't do it. It's not my fault that I didn't pay more money to get a sixth person in here to come and clean my kitchen. Bull crap. You didn't do the job that I paid you to do. These guys are getting tens of millions of freaking dollars to win those games, and they didn't show up. Period. Now, if you did pay $25 an hour for a sixth person to come in and clean, would more have gotten done? Yeah, probably. Is it possible that the whole kitchen could have gotten clean over those five hours? Especially if he's a higher quality cleaner? Yeah, maybe. Don't really know. It's no way to know. Maybe maybe because all these guys are high quality cleaners, just because I hire another high quality cleaner, like really fast, really diligent, doesn't mean that they suddenly are just going to choose not to, to do a good job. Because maybe they just decide to sit around and smoke pot all day with, you know, with the kids or whatever. I don't know. The analogy is getting weird. but Yeah, but maybe it gets done. And so maybe I should have just paid more. No, that's bullcrap because it's ignoring the problem that these people basically freaking stole from us. I paid you to do a job and you didn't do it. It's not on me because I didn't pay more for more people to get you more help. Do the freaking job. Oh, dang. Odell Beckham going to fly in to meet the Jets. Anyways, folks, I'm going to leave it at that. You guys have yourselves a fantastic rest of your night. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.